we wanted to then even take a different concept about the way wealth works and a different notion about wealth. We now think about it as wealth is our portfolio, our RSPs, or 401ks, I believe, mm -hmm. in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and we realize that that wealth is, again, you can't eat it. Yes. Um, what we wanted to do is take the wealth that we had developed over, over time and convert it into this. So we grow our food in the summer and we store it in order to access it for the winter. We store our water in ponds during the fall and winter rains so that we can, st we can access it in the summer when we're growing food. Yes. And we're storing um, our shelter in a housing that is way lower tech and more handmade mm -hmm. so that we can access shelter when we need to repair it or maintain it or um, without needing to go to experts because that yeah. expertise is now stored here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that's the learning that we're wanting to do here and pass on to the kids. Welcome to Big Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm in Souk, which is on the southern corner of Vancouver Island, at a place called Inishog Farm, with its owners, the family of Mary Call, Finn, Chloe, Steve Unger. Thanks for joining me. It's really lovely to be Thank at your you. farm. It's, it's sweet. So, how did this get started? So, we uh, used to live in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> and um, almost three years ago, we moved here. We sold our house and put everything we had into the farm. Mm. Um, it's an old homestead from the original settlement of Souk, and it's 130 acres mm. of open mm. fields and wild woods and creeks mm. and an old orchard. And we are here to learn how to live as self-sufficiently as we can, mm -hmm. as well as learn how to contribute and um, give to the community and the local economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one little piece of this is that you two are being homeschooled by your mom and dad, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you like about living here? Um, well, because there, we have animals to play with. And it's bigger because in Vancouver it's tiny. Chloe, what kind of animals do you have here? Chickens and at the moment turkeys. Mm -hmm. We had pigs, mm -hmm. but um, they're not here right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are, but where are they? Where are those pigs <laughs> in your tummy? <laughs> yes, thank you pigs for being food. Yeah. So, a notion that... Um, what you're doing is, is, is bringing yourselves onto the land and, quote, improving it, that is making it reliable for yourselves. And there's a lot of vision that you have for this, you know, permaculture and ponds and orchards and so on. What's underneath, what underlies that, Steve? Give us an idea of what philosophy you kind of have come up with, what you're doing. Well, you talked a little bit about the resilience part. We wanted mm -hmm. to basically be self-sufficient and even more than self-sufficient, be resilient and try and build community again and and really we realize that so much of what we do in the city because we both grew up in the city is really subcontracted out to other people uh -huh. so you're really living on a very fine line you don't realize it on a day-to-day -day basis but for the most part you know if the bank machine goes down or if the visa machine goes down you're kind of you, you can't maybe can't even eat because visa has gone right. down right so we wanted to relearn the old ways and apply some of that um, and in fact, we wanted to then even take a different concept about the way wealth works and a different notion about wealth. We now think about it as wealth is our portfolio, our RSPs, or 401ks, I believe, mm -hmm. in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and we realized that that wealth is, again, you can't eat it. Yes. Um, what we wanted to do is take the wealth that we had developed over, over time and convert it into this. Um, and even more so, look at it as, as our education and our know-how how to actually build a house out of mud that you dig out of the ground as being a huge asset as opposed to, you know, stocks in whatever company you had. So you're seeing two things. You're learning. Is, is you're, you're investing in your learning, yeah. actually. You have skills that have some real durability, maybe yeah. we could think of, yeah. and that others may want to learn from you. 
And, and the other is that you're, you're making real wealth here, right? Your real wealth is in your buildings or you know, your orchards or you know, the animals that you mm -hmm. raise. The way we're beginning to frame it for ourselves is that we are storing things in a way different way than, than we're used to. So we're used to storing our money in banks and we're used to storing our energy in utility companies and mm -hmm. our education in schools. Um, our healthcare and hospitals, and the technology that you use to store determines how easily you can access that wealth. Um, and so, we're trying to bring that storage of all those things back to our own household and mm -hmm. take personal responsibility for it. So, we grow our food in the summer and we store it in order to access it for the winter. We store our water in ponds during the fall and winter rains so that we can st we can access it in the summer when we're growing food. Yes. And we're storing um, our shelter in a housing that is way lower tech and more handmade mm -hmm. so that we can access shelter when we need to repair it or maintain it or um, without needing to go to experts because that yeah. expertise is now stored here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that's the learning that we're wanting to do here and pass on to the kids. Um, because that's resilience, is yes. being able to access whatever yes. it is you're yes. storing. You're in control, if you will, you know, yeah. managing. Yeah. Now, one of the pieces of storage that I really am looking forward to sharing with our audience is you are also storing warmth. You know, warmth and it, being warm is really important, particularly in the northern latitudes, which yeah. says all of Canada and North, Amer North America. Uh, mm -hmm. Northern North America. Um, and one of the so we'll we'll go up and take a look at the Cobb House that's in under construction and how you're getting warmth from that. First, let me step back and say the room that we are in, this little cabin that you built, um, where you all are living, is a tiny house. Mm -hmm. Really, a t how how what's our square footage here? Um, it's 168 square feet on this floor, and then with the loft, it's about 250 square feet in total. So 160 odd feet in you know square feet. With our kitchen. 12 by 14. 12 by yeah. 14 room. Feet. Yes. Yeah. And a little library and bookshelves and some storage under here and a kitchen table and a sleeping loft and the clothes and everything up there. Cozy. Cozy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I understand that you wanted to try out some of the ideas for the big house that you're working on here. What were those ideas that are we see here? Well, so the first one is this is primarily built out of recycled materials. Mm -hmm. So there was an old farmhouse on the property. Um, that we took down by hand and salvaged as much of the material as possible. So you can see like the floors and the counters and stuff are all recycled material. Mm -hmm. Even the studs in the wall. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We do realize that, you know, old technology and old stuff is great, but you know, we have some wonderful new technologies like double pane windows yes. and yes. metal roofs. Yes. Those are really good things and insulation, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, so we kind of molded those two together. In addition, the cabin faces directly south with big windows on the side. And on a day like today, you can see the sun fully floods into the, mm -hmm. into the room and, and warms it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, after the cabin, the next building we built was a, an office where I work most of the time um, that is cob, and the walls are a foot thick. And we also um, then played with a living roof as well. So it has a living roof on top that has Strawberry. Four, strawberry plants. I can't remember how many. Mm -hmm. um, and we tend to get 50 or 60 pounds of strawberries off the, off the roof every year. Um, and part of that is because the warmth from the room um, actually gets the strawberry plants going a little bit earlier in the spring and keeps them going a little bit longer in the autumn. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So those are a couple of the ideas that you, you played with, which yeah. is nice. I love the idea of sort of a little test bed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all of you you know, living together in this space, there's a, some bonding that's happening that isn't true in maybe a suburban house where everybody has their own separate bedroom, for yeah. example. Um, so yeah. you learned. So, anything else to add, or should we go take a look at the house in progress? Mm. Should we do that? Take a look. Maybe you can show us the chickens on the way? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. Hello. 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 What are these? The Dorkies. What's a Dorkie? Dorkie. 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 Dork
and you are right there with the feet. Nice. You've got a, a nice upper kitchen. So, what's this? Tell it's me. a cob oven. Cob oven. Cob oven. Okay, tell me one thing about the cob oven, Finn. We cook pizzas in it. Pizzas? Wow. And we cook Christmas dinner in it with chickens and turkeys. Wow. In here? Yep. Mm -hmm. Was it good? Does it taste good? It has. Mm -hmm. So why why did you do a cob oven? Here. Well, we were learning how to do cob, and it was a really accessible way. It didn't take very long, just a day workshop to do it with a friend who guided us through. Mm -hmm. And um, we sourced all the materials from on the farm. Really? The clay and the sand and the, the grassy, and the grassy straw, straw, the rocks. Yeah. Steve, tell us something about this grant. How long did it take to build? Um, it only took a couple of days to build it. Um, and I guess for me, the big thing I always really like about it is the fact that we use like leftover pieces of wood from building the house or building mm. whatever to cook our meals. Mm. So mm. again, it's it's resilient and reusing. You know, basically, what's a waste to cook Christmas dinner? So if the power goes down, we're off grid with our cooking. I sure. like it. All yeah. right, good point. Right, it's like you've always got your oven, and mm -hmm. you can get anything in it. It's actually cool because. You heat it up to a really high temperature, and then you bake all the high temperature things, like the the roasts, mm -hmm. the casseroles, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then as the temperature dissipates, you put in your breads, and then you put in your pies, and then you put in your dried fruits, those sorts wow. of things, so that you use the heat. If for an entire day, you can plan out a whole sort of week's cooking. It's how they used to do it, and and some communities used to have a central cob oven and all the women will get together and do their baking for the week together. Together. Oh, yeah. I love it. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Okay, on to the cob house, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When the bus stops, there's right at the head of the camera, people run up and jump on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's true. Well, this is the first one of you guys hitchhiking, and I know there's a truck full of equipment right yeah. there. and warm. I mean, this is quite a bit warmer than it is out in the cool, cool air. So tell us, beautiful windows. Tell us what we're looking at here, this, this side. This is the south-facing side of the house. <laughs> so this is the thermal mass side of the house. Um, we built about two foot thick cob walls, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. absorb all the heat from the sun. And the windows allow the sun to come in, and the floor is cob, and that absorbs the, the sun's heat as well. Oh. And then the walls here, uh, different times of the year, when the sun reaches those walls, they also are made of cob and absorb the heat. So you're getting, so let me make sure I understand. In the winter when the sun is low, it'll come across as it is here, actually, mm -hmm. and that's warming cob floor or the, or the, and or the cob wall, which of course will happen when you, if you use the, the wood stove. So this is the heat collecting room, right? So it's at the heat storage and then over in the evening it'll dissipate mm -hmm. and then the next day or if it's a cloudy day we'll still have some banked in the floor or the walls and it'll just really mitigate the fluctuations in temperature. And it's oh, so it's, it's even for mm -hmm. you. Now the floors, Stephen you had mentioned storing heat in the floor? Yeah, yeah, as we talked about earlier, I mean, one of the things we're trying to do with this house is store as much energy, food, whatever as we can inside of it. So, in fact, there is, we dug a basement under the house, but we, there's no basement. It actually got filled back in with, with rock and sand and as much thermal material as we could. So what we really have under the house is a big heat battery or earth battery or solar battery, depending on what term you want to use. The system we have in place is called a annualized geosolar. So the annualized is we take the summer sun, store it under the house. Wait a minute, how do you store the summer sun? We back in right. the, what ways it's, you know, yeah. the summer sun can get collected and it's down here. Yeah, good point. We have uh, solar thermal panels on the top of the house. Which is wa wa our water. water. Yeah. Okay. yeah, we have water panels on the top of the house. They get heated by the sun and then we pump that heat through uh, heating pipes. There's mm -hmm. 600 feet of heating pipe underneath the house. Um, and we primarily do that in the summer. Um, because there's about 600 tons of thermal material under the house, you can imagine it takes a long, long, long time to That's heat up that amount of material. Is it earth? Is it dirt? Or? It's uh, primarily crushed rock uh -huh. and sand and, uh -huh. and 
Yeah. Yeah, it takes a while for a rock. You notice that when you go to yeah. the river, it's a rock. It takes a while for the yeah. heat to come be felt. All right. That's right. So it's stored in here in it's the It's stored in here, and then over the summer it slowly heats up underneath the house, mm -hmm. and then in the winter that heat will start coming up and rising into the house and keep the house warm at a, hopefully at a relatively um, ambient temperature of around room temperature. Nice, nice. Yeah. Now, what a, does it heat everything everywhere equally or? No, um, as I, like I said, the principle of it is the, the water pipes are under the center of the house. And the heat center. Under the center the house, right underneath this wall here. Under this wall. Yeah, okay, about right. eight feet down are where the water pipes are. All right. Um, and the heat will slowly radiate out over time. Okay. Um, and what we have is the floor is insulated up to about three feet from this wall. So that the heat that's coming doesn't come up here. Doesn't come up here. Floor. Right. So as you can imagine, you know, the heat, you know, here we heated this in, in August, we heated this in September, ah. we up to here in October, and then we've heated here in November, and here there's no insulation. So then in November, the so heat's coming heat up on the margins of your house, I see. Back in. Oh, really? I mean, it's yeah. like, the, you know, a house that gets heated in this that's and right. circulates back in toward the center. That's right. And then through the winter, the heat in the battery dissipates mm -hmm. into the house. Mm -hmm. So that come the next summer, we recharge that battery, and then the heat travels across, across, across. Come beginning of winter, that heat then comes back into the house and discharges the battery. Yeah. So that's the annual cycle okay. of storage. Okay. Okay. So we're using summer sun to heat the house in this the winter. This is brilliant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is, I mean, and all relatively passive. And so the Australians do it with big water cisterns under their houses, and they heat the water in similar ways, and then draw that heat. So here we're very seismic. We looked at digging big cistern, putting water, but we realized that it would be at risk of cracks, mm -hmm. potentially, mm -hmm. and then it's sort of that once off and you can't really recharge that right. cistern with water. Mm -hmm. So then we looked at all sorts of materials that would be thermal mass that would hold and store heat. Um, be beeswax is one of the best stores of heat. Um, and then uh, all sorts of other materials like sand and rock. And we looked at using the indigenous earth that was under here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but there was so much organic material in there that it could actually mm -hmm. compromise the structure mm -hmm. of it. So mm -hmm. we had to engineer it properly mm -hmm. to hold the weight of the house. And that's why we, we chose the rock. That's it. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, next, this coming year, you get to test one cycle and, and find how it is. And yeah. I've, I, somebody mentioned that it may take a couple of years to That's get right. the full capacity, like yeah. charging any battery, yeah. actually. Think yeah. about we, it. we turned the system on in the middle of August when mm -hmm. we finally got the panels and the pumps and everything hooked up. Mm -hmm. And the ground underneath the house was at 12 degrees Celsius. And even in that late kind of summer, early fall or autumn sun, the heat of the ground came up by 2 degrees Celsius, up to 14 degrees, because we have a bunch of sensors okay. under to monitor. So that was a pretty good indication that it will work. Um, and then, of course, going through a whole summer, then we'll really see what happens. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but even on a day like today, where it's lovely sun, I don't know if you can hear in the background, but actually the solar hot water system is running right now, so we are actually pumping heat mm -hmm. into the house underground at, at this very moment. You're going to be cozy. Yeah. You're going to be cozy here in winter, aren't you? Yeah. Having said that, the, the solar aspect of the house is the most passive. There are no moving parts involved in the cob walls and the sun being absorbed by it. The battery has some moving parts, so there are pumps and there's the solar panels above sending the water down below. Um, that's a little bit riskier, but it's yet one sort of backup. And then the wood stove, there's not a whole lot of moving parts as sure. you can heat with wood that we've got loads of windfall around the place. Right, so we've got, got a, a renewable a resource. So you've, yeah. got, so you've got redundancy. I mean, that's part of resilience. Yeah. Is you, you can back it up, back it up using this. And besides, this is a very known technology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's not esoteric, and it's cozy. Yeah. yeah. Now you did something entirely different on the cold side of your house. You didn't do the big cob wall. So. Would you take me for a tour over to your cool sure. rooms or the cool side? Yeah. Well, the walls on the north side look 
as thick as the, the south side, but you said they're different. What, yeah. What's, what gives? Yeah, so it's a hybrid house. So we tried to use the appropriate technology for the appropriate side of the house because we had talked to other people who had cob houses. And on the south side, the cob is wonderful, mm -hmm. absorbs all the heat. On the north side, the cob can actually suck heat out of your house. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So what we've done on this side of the house, and actually on the east and the west walls, is it's actually a foot thick, as you can see here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's filled with blow-in insulation. Oh, so it's just a frame, wood frame. Yeah, it's a double with insulation. Yeah, there's a stud here and a stud here, and then we just fill it full of insulation in the middle. So these walls are about the equivalent of uh, R40 in insulation. That's really, really nice. So, yeah. so it, it keeps the cool side of the house yeah. uh, from losing heat. That's right. And also, you've got a, you've got a cool room. That's right. right. Yeah, you we use have a cool, that cool. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, exactly. Can you take us to the cool room? Mm hmm. Okay. Is there a light? Not yet. Is there a light? Yeah. Thank you. Oh wow. This does feel like coming you're walking into a walk-in cooler. Mm -hmm. It really does. What temperature do you think it is now? Oh, the thermometer's gone. Um, there, there was a cold spell this winter and we went down to four degrees in here. Four degrees Celsius, which Celsius. is it's just above freezing. Probably about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, wow, perfect. And right perfect. now it's about 10. It's been holding at 10. Yeah, so it's probably about 50 degrees Fahrenheit in here. So you didn't insulate these walls as much? Is that no, right? No, these walls are insulated, They're insulated as well. insulated also? Yeah, yeah. Um, and this wall is insulated away from the rest of the house. So it doesn't pick up the warmth. So it doesn't pick up the heat from the house. And the reason we insulated these walls is because in the summer, it can get up to 80, you know, 85 degrees outside. Mm -hmm. And we want to try and keep this cold. It's easy to keep it cold in the winter. Sure. In the sure. summer, sure. this is where That's we really want to keep it cold. Well, it, it's sort of like your root cellar, but it's not underground. Exactly. Right? So this, what are you going to use it for? It's cold storage. Our thought was that in the event that we couldn't use refrigerators anymore, um, people used to have cold pantries in their mm -hmm. houses, mm -hmm. and they would have little meshed openings that would draw the cold air in and the flow of air back out. And so we wanted to model that. We wanted to have this in the house and use it for all sorts of uh, our jams and uh, the stuff from the gardens, the, the, right, the pickles and the, 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 the root vegetables yeah, that you exactly. want yeah. to have last for months and the apples. Right? Yeah. I'll tell you a quick story. Robin and I, for a while, lived in an older house that was probably built in the early 1900s and it had what they called there a California cooler. Mm. And sure enough, it's what you're talking about. It had venting. We had a, there was a down, a partial basement and the, it was a vent, just screens. And the air, cool air, came up from the earth through yeah. through screened shelving, right through through a vent to release the warm air yeah. up top, and we replicated that in the house that we have yeah. now because it's like you you need that you want that yeah. mm -hmm. you know so I'm really this this I am looking forward to seeing what this house is like yeah finished so are we <laughs> <laughs> you too right what mm -hmm. so do you have a favorite room in the house. The, uh, under the stairs. All right. Will you give us the last bit of tour? Give us the under the stairs room. You called it the Harry Potter room. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Chloe? Harry Potter's bedroom. Harry Potter's bedroom. Will you take us to Harry Potter's bedroom? In the first room. Oh, in the first room. Sorry. Okay. Because he moved upstairs. Mm -hmm. Rather messy. Well, it's being built. Here's the under the stairs room. And mom and dad were doing other stuff on the house. Yeah. And they were like, "Why are they bringing stones in?" You you were bringing stones. Yeah. In, and in then here. They saw this and they were like, "That's a brilliant idea." Mm -hmm. So then, if you go over to the wood stove over there, they actually copied our idea. And brought river stones to put by the stove? Beach stones. Beach stones. Really? Well, I think this is a magical room you two have. Really. It'll be fun to see what you do with it in the future. Okay. Let's go back outside to the porch. And we'll say our goodbyes.
what you have here is amazing and ambitious. I mean, I look at all you're trying to undertake, and it's like, mm. wow, that's a lot. So, have got any last thoughts before we wrap here? Well, most of what we showed you today, we um, have done ourselves and have been building our, our own self-sufficiency. But in the process, we've learned that it's absolutely impossible for us to be entirely self-sufficient and to be able to do it all on our own. And that we really do need to build community and work with others and build on what others have done. And so much of what we've done here, we've built on what others did in their places and learned from them and talked to them and they came here and helped us do it. So in that sense, we were building some community, which was fabulous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our, our builder was actually a guy who helped Ann and Gord build their house. And of course, Ann and Gord provided us a lot of guidance and Gord was here mm -hmm. actually laying the floors with us. Mm -hmm. um, we've had other local people, there's a local um, carpenter, artisan I would call him, actually did all the doors in the house. Mm -hmm. and. You know, we kept him as part of our community and built that as well. So the house was more than just, you know, a house. We really tried to use local people and build a local community in the process of doing it. Mm -hmm. And we know we need to extend that to the farm. And sure. Because there's sure. so many projects on the go that it is overwhelming. Make our heads explode sometimes. And it's hard, for sure. Uh, you, it's an ambitious undertaking, a big undertaking. And... What you were also doing, you talked at the beginning about returning to some of the older values and practices. Yeah. And that seems to me part of it. Nobody ever farmed alone. Nobody yeah. ever did a farm right. all by themselves. It was extended families and so on. And I think there are a lot of people going to have, people like you are going to pioneer how do we return to that in this time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the tour. You're Thank welcome. you for the tour of mm -hmm. all the rooms and all the work you're doing. And we would like to come back when the house is more finished for another tour, I think it would be okay? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're watching Peak Moment. I'm Janaya Donaldson, and welcome to the Inishog Farmstead. We'll see what it's like in a few years. Join us next time. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Janaya Donaldson. I'm in the town of Souk, which is on the south coast. Hello, try it again. <laughs> Whoa. See? It's not Emmy, we all know this, right? <laughs>